All right, so we are looking today at our first apologist, G.K. Chesterton. Little history on him. He was born in the last quarter of the 1900s. Sorry, 1800s, 19th century. I still have trouble with that even after all this time. And uh, he was born in the UK. He trained, oddly enough, as an artist, but never really made use of that. Instead, he was more in the literary arena. He was uh, a peer of a number of really big names in English literature, George Bernard Shaw, H.G. Wells, Rudyard Kipling. And he was actually really good friends with Shaw, which is hilarious in the fact that they never agreed. Shaw was a militant atheist. Chesterton was Anglican and then later Catholic. And yet they were apparently good enough friends that they spent a lot of time together. And what Chesterton is best known for, apart from his fictional character, Father Brown, is his attempt to take on the literary and philosophical minds of his time as they sought to pull down the church and Christianity in general. Now, I don't know how many of you tried to tackle the book Heretics this week or last week, but if you did, you will have found that it takes a good deal of effort to get through it. There is a lot in here that would um, require a, a thorough knowledge of his current times being, you know, around the turn of the 20th century. There are a lot of names in it that some have st stood the test of time and you can say, oh yeah, I vaguely remember hearing about that person. And some have been absolutely lost to time. But one thing you can be sure of is that Chesterton was very much involved in his society. He read widely, he responded to what he read. He kept track of the, the events of his day, the discussions, what was being said, what was not being said. And if you only made it through the first two chapters of the book, you would have a fair idea of what he wanted to say to his time. And Just, let's just look at it a little bit to start out with things that he said. One thing that very much struck me at the end of the first chapter, he gives a little bit of an allegory. And he says, suppose that a great commotion arises in the street about something, let's say a lamppost, which many influential persons desire to pull down. A gray-clad monk who is the spirit of the Middle Ages is approached upon the matter and begins to say, in the arid manner of the schoolman, first of all, let us consider, my brethren, the value of light. If light be in itself good, at this point he is somewhat excusably knocked down, and all the people make a rush for the lamppost. Lamppost is down in ten minutes, and they go about congratulating each other on their unmedieval practicality. But as things go on, they do not work out so easily. Some people have pulled the lamppost down because they wanted electric lights. 
some because they wanted old iron, some because they wanted darkness because their deeds were evil. Some thought it not enough of a lamppost, some too much. Some acted because they wanted to smash municipal machinery, some because they just wanted to smash something. And there's war in the night, no man knowing whom he strikes. So gradually and inevitably, today, tomorrow, or the next day, there comes back the, convi the conviction that the monk was right after all, and it all depends on what is the philosophy of light. Only what we might have discussed under the gas lamp, we must now discuss in the dark. And if you look at that little story, you see how he saw his own time. Of course, what does the lamp stand for? The lamp stands for Christianity. And there are many, many people for many, many reasons who just want to pull it down. And the trouble is, once they've got rid of it, what do they do? And this, this leads into something that he says in the second chapter, talking about um, the playwright Ibsen and um, George Bernard Shaw's words upon him saying, right? So the golden rule of Ibsen is that there's no longer any golden rule. There are no rules. And he says, the absence of an enduring and positive ideal or a permanent key to virtue is the one great Ibsen merit. But Chesterton says, you know, I'm not discussing right now with any fullness whether this is so or not. All I venture to point out with an increased firmness is that this omission, good or bad, does leave us face to face with the problem of a human consciousness filled with a very definite image of evil and no definite image of good. Now this was said about a 19th century playwright. But look at us in the 21st century. We have a very definite image of what is not good. Of the problems that beset this world. The problem with all of this is having a very good and very clear image of what's wrong only gets you so far. Without an image of what's right and good, where do you go from this is bad? I mean, and take up what appears to be uh, Kayla's favorite topic right now of um, racial injustice. We all say, bad. But how many people can you talk to who will give you the same answer of how to fix it? Where to go from here? How to make things right? If you went to any crowd of protesters, I bet you would get almost as many answers as you would uh, groups of people who had joined the protest. How do we know what's good? This has not changed at all from the time they tried to pull the lamppost down. And Chesterton is very much concerned with getting to the basis of what do we think about what's good, what's right. Which is kind of the, I mean, if you look at how he started, in the very first chapter, where he talks about how once upon a time, heretics never thought of themselves as heretics. They were right. And those who called themselves orthodox were heretics. They were the wrong ones. But by the time you'd hit the end of the 19th century, there was this strange idea that heresy, as Chesterton puts it, not only 
means being long, wrong, it practically means being clear headed and courageous. And orthodoxy no longer means being right, it practically means being wrong. And he says this can mean one thing and one thing only that people care less for whether they are philosophically right. For obviously a man ought to confess himself crazy before he confesses himself heretical. And he talks about things like, you know, people say random things, but they don't think to the end of it. What does this mean for all of life? And indeed, he says that people are almost considered in bad taste if they want to talk about important things, things that really matter. He talks about you know, at any innocent tea table, we may easily hear a man say life is not worth living. And we regard that statement as we regard the statement that it's a, it's a fine day. Nobody thinks it could possibly have any serious effect on the man or on the world. But if that were really believed, that statement, life is not worth living, the world would stand on its head. Murderers would be given medals for saving men from life. Firemen would be denounced for keeping men from death. Poisons would be used as medicines. Doctors would be called in when people were well. And the Royal Humane Society would be rooted out like a horde of assassins. But we never speculate as to whether this conversational pessimist will strengthen or disorganize society. We are convinced that theories do not matter. And I want to ask you something. Have you ever listened to just random conversation of people in your community, people in your circle of acquaintance, and stopped and thought if they really meant what they just said? How would that affect their world? Have you ever listened to the lyrics of songs and thought, if that was how the whole world really worked, what would that do to our society? But people, right, they say things, random things, but they never stop and think, What does this actually mean to our view of the way things really are? And Chesterton is very concerned with the way we see the way things really are. People will say that, you know, you can believe whatever you want, but you shouldn't talk about it. The trouble is, whatever you believe always, always leaks out in what you do. So whether you use words or not, you are always advertising what you believe. If people hear you grumbling and complaining all the time, they're going to know something about you. If they see you ignore someone in need, you don't have to say a word, they're gonna know something about you. And it's important to sit down with oneself at least and with the people around you and have some good serious discussions about how do you see the world as it as it is what do you really think about for one thing why are we here why do human beings exist why does the universe exist how does it exist because these things that sound like you know huge far-flung irrelevant theories are intensely relevant to the way we work out then how we live. And one of the ideas 
that had reached almost epidemic proportions in Chesterton's time comes out of a what they refer to as a like early modern pre-modern philosophy propounded by a man whose name you might have heard Friedrich Nietzsche and Nietzsche had this idea first of all he was the one who was going about proclaiming God to be dead but then he was also proclaiming the need for a new kind of human being, which he referred to in the English translations. It sounds funny to say the Superman. And we, of course, you say Superman, you think da 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 da. But Nietzsche was thinking of something different. He was thinking of a man with no weaknesses. You have to think what does he think by weakness? Nietzsche's idea of weakness is mercy, compassion, long suffering, faith. Nietzsche's Superman was a man who was freed from all these things. And this idea of the perfect superhuman who was strong and rational had really seized on the imagination of many, especially of the, the philosophical elite in England at that time. It led to certain things, right? We talk about how what you believe works out in what you do. This idea of a superhuman worked itself out in uh, ideas of what they called um, medical marriage, where people would be like racehorses or dogs for perfect, for the strong, for the beautiful, for the intelligent. And if that didn't creep you out enough, they were also, if you look at the flip side of that, proponents of preventing the marriages of those considered unfit. That they should not procreate and distribute their inferior genetics to the detriment of society. And of course, we know in hindsight what this led to, don't we? This led to the Third Reich, to the extermination camps, to the idea that anyone who did not bear the perfect Teutonic physical and mental ideal should be put to death. And people say that what you think about th the way things really are doesn't matter. But Chesterton lived before that. He did not know what this was going to lead to and yet I think he suspected Chesterton addresses in, let me see, do, 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 which chapter is it? Not three, not, I think it must be chapter five. Let's try that. Yes, is his address to H.G. Wells. Now, of course, we think H.G. Wells and all we really remember is um, War of the Worlds and things like that. But Mr. Wells was also an essayist. And apparently, he decided at one point to write an essay called Mankind in the Making. And he starts talking about this idea of scientific medical marriage. Because to him, the purpose of humanity is to produce more humanity. And his idea was that with the proper approach to the production of humanity, we could develop a utopia. That's another thing 
that was really big in the 19th century. The idea that it was possible to create an ideal human society. If you, in his case, um, created the right human beings, or if you provided the right education, if everyone had education, if any, everyone had um, you know, basic income, if everybody, then you would have a utopia where people would no longer be selfish. And of course, this, I think, probably has a lot to do with another of the early proto-modern writers, Karl Marx, talking about how, right, obviously, we can all agree that the industrial era led to some massive abuses, some problems that were life or death to millions of people. And of course, then, what do we do? How do we make this into, from a you know, dystopian society to a utopian? And of course, communism is one response to that question. Well, everyone should share and share alike. Of course, in hindsight, right, we have looked at a number of incarnations of communism and what has happened in every one of them is human greed and corruption has led to abuses equal to the rampant and uncontrolled capitalism that Marx was reacting against. But in the 19th century, all of this still seemed full of possibility. That if you could just find the one thing external that needed to be changed. Well, let's distribute property or let's provide universal education. Let's do all of these things. Then you could provide yourself with a utopia. And Chesterton goes through what Wells says about Um, you know, what, what makes for a utopia? And he says, in his new utopia, for instance, he says that a chief point of the utopia will be a disbelief in original sin. Now, if he had begun with the human soul, that is, if he had begun on himself, he would have found original sin almost the first thing to be believed in. He would have found, to put the matter shortly, that a permanent possibility of selfishness arises from the mere fact of having a self. And not from any accidents of education, or of ill treatment. And the weak, weakest, the weakness of all utopias is this, that they take the greatest difficulty of man and assume it to be overcome, and then give an elaborate account of the overcoming of the smaller ones. Because obviously, right, no utopia can stand as long as there is even one selfish person in it. There are so many things. And this is one reason why I enjoy studying history. There are so many things that you can find strewn along the wake of the human race that explain why we are where we are right now. If we would only pay attention to it. If we would look back at <laughs> all of these attempts to solve the problems of humanity without Christ. And just remember, there's nothing new under the sun. We are in a particularly uh, acute situation of that right now. They call, you know, the COVID pandemic unprecedented, but it isn't, not technically. It has the precedence of Black Death, Spanish Flu, many other incidences where people started to travel around, disease started to travel around. And of course, 
scientists look back at these instances and say, all right, so this is what happened there. And they look back at similar diseases. How did we treat that? Let's see if this works on this new thing, right? Why is it that in philosophy alone, there seems to be some sort of idea that looking back at the past is the, the least useful thing you can do. I don't understand that. But that's one reason why I like to go back to writers like Chesterton, even though he writes in um, late Victorian literary English, which takes a lot of practice to read and to really comprehend even though he mentions names that I have no idea who these people are and I have really no way to find out who they are because history has not preserved them. Despite all of these difficulties, I like going back to writers like Chesterton because so many of the things he talks about sound so familiar. Let me read you a little bit out of chapter two, because this is one of those things we, if, when we're talking about apologetics that we really do need to keep in mind. He talks about every one of the popular modern phrases and ideals is a dodge in order to shirk the problem of what is good. We are fond of talking about liberty. That is a dodge to avoid discussing what's good. We're fond of talking about progress. That's a dodge to avoid discussing what's good. We're fond of talking about education. That's a dodge to avoid discussing what's good. The modern man says, let us leave all these arbitrary standards and embrace liberty. That is logically rendered, let us not decide what is good, but let it be considered good not to decide it. He says, away with your old moral formulae, I am for progress. That is logically stated, let's not to settle what is good, but let's settle whether we are getting more of it. He says, neither in religion nor morality, my friend, lie the hopes of the race, but in education. This clearly expressed means we can't decide what is good, but let's give it to our children. There are a lot of things that people bring up as hot button topics. But if you dig down to the root of all of them, I suspect you will find that it's a bit of a dodge not to say it just so that you don't have to ask what really is good and right. But that is what we are called to ask. And not only to ask, but to defend. People say to you, well, you shouldn't try to restrain this or that because that's just mean. Restrictions are mean? Are they really? So you shouldn't say to small children, don't touch the burner when it's red. It's hot, it will burn you. Instead, we should let them figure that out for themselves. If that really were the best way, would any of us have reached this age without massive burn scars on our hands, our faces, any other part of us? Doubt it. But restrictions are mean. You have to ask, why do restrictions exist? You have to dig down deeper. And that's one of the things that Chesterton is really good at. Beneath all of his paradox and his usually quite hilarious um, phrasing of things, 
you have to dig down underneath the surface to see what are people really saying? There are so many things that, I mean, so many quotes out of this book that I would love to bring up to you, but I don't have the time. But he talks about, in large part, how simply unsatisfactory these attempts are at tearing down the old morality and replacing it with, in some cases, nothing, and in other cases, something just really insipid. Like he talks about, you know, one of the big things in the modern times, the 19th century, was um, how art should be liberated from the traditional standards of aesthetics. It should be unmoral. And he says, the theory of the unmorality of art has established itself firmly in the art strictly artistic classes. They are free to produce anything they like. They are free to write a paradise lost in which Satan shall conquer God. They are free to write a divine comedy in which heaven shall be under the floor of hell. And what have they done? Have they produced in their universality anything grander or more beautiful than the things uttered by that fierce Ghibelline Catholic, Catholic by the rigid Puritan schoolmaster? No, he says. Milton does not merely beat them at his piety, he beats them at their own irreverence. In their little books of verse, you will not find a finer defiance of God than Satan's. He's talking about Paradise Lost, written by Milton. Nor will you find the grandeur of paganism felt as Dante, felt it, who described Ferranta lifting his head as in disdain of hell. He says, the reason is really obvious. Blasphemy is an artistic effect because it depends on a philosophical conviction. And he, he, this is one of those things that just kind of make me snicker. He says, if anyone doubts that blasphemy depends on belief, let him sit down seriously and try to think blasphemous thoughts about Thor, talking about the Norse god, right? He says, I think his family will find him at the end of the day in a state of some exhaustion. He's like, you cannot think blasphemous thoughts about something you don't actually believe in. And he says, the rejection of general theories has never proved a success. So you can't say, you know, art is unmoral because that just kind of drains the, the vitality out of it. But I would say you can't live life as if it were unmoral. Because when you dig down deep into what is moral, it means it, it means you have a goal. You have a destination. Unmorality is life without any direction. And if you, just thinking, if you had a, a cross country race without a route, you know, starter pistol fires and all these skiers head off in every which direction, who wins? How do you know if you did better this time than you did last time? How do you even know if everybody completed the race? just have to trust that no one wandered off and got lost and is still out there somewhere days later, slogging onward. But to have a goal, that means you have a route and you can tell if you're making progress along it. And that's one of the things that really scares me about this idea of everyone having an idea of what they don't want but not what we all need. Of having an idea of this is evil, that is evil, but not having an idea of this is good, this is holy. And that's one of the reasons why I decided to go with apologetics 
as the second uh, uh, second section of this quarter. Because it is very easy to listen to somebody saying something very eloquent, very noble words, and to get carried along by that without actually stopping to think, where is this gonna end up? Will this make us better? Or will this just leave us where we are? And the last thing I'd like to bring to your attention, I was thinking about this as I was reading through heretics. I think the passage of scripture that Chesterton reminds me of the most. And you know, if you go through here, he does not use scripture in his arguments because he's arguing against people who don't believe scripture to be valid. But the thing in Chesterton that I am reminded most of is 1 Corinthians chapter one. The word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For consider your calling brothers, not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing the things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And that puts paid to this idea of the superman as what we need. Because what happens when people get stronger and stronger and stronger is that they get more isolated. They get prouder. They don't need each other. They don't need God. They don't need anything. But we know, not being super humans, that what we don't want to need is what we need the most. And right now we know more than ever how much we need one another, how much we need Jesus. We are brought to our own weaknesses, like Paul says, so that his strength might be shown through us. And I think in the area of apologetics, that's one of the most important things to remember. You do not need to be one of the elite. You do not need to be the smartest, the most educated, what you do need is the spirit of God in you, the willingness to be used by God, and open ears to hear what the people around you are really saying. I don't know that any of us in this particular group are called to apologetics. 
not in the big flashy public debate sense, but in the sense that we think through what we hear and we speak what God puts in us. We are all called to this because that is part of the gospel.